have your attention, please? My name's Eleanor Hamilton, and although you probably don't know me, I may well have told you where to go. It's my voice that tells you when your train is about to arrive on the London Underground. The next train to arrive alongside Platform 2 is a district line service, calling at all stations to Mansion House, via Victoria and Embankment. And if you're based in the West Midlands, then you'll have heard me on the tram. This tram terminates at Wolverhampton St George's. I usually work alongside my husband, Phil Sayer, who's the voice of many safety announcements above and below ground. But the one he's most famous for is this. Mind the gap. The thing is that we're not automated voices, we're real. And I'd like to say that we're living and breathing, but one of us isn't anymore. Phil died in 2016, but his voice recordings still exist, so he's still working alongside me in tube tunnels every single day. I love that we're still together in work, even though we can't be together in person. But we're not the only voices with a story. Almost everyone you hear on buses, trains, TV adverts and down phone lines is real. We've all lived, and we all have tales to tell. And you know our voices well, without really knowing us at all. So I'm going to change that by telling you their tales from the tannoy. In this episode, I'm going to talk to the calm, assured voice of ITN News. This is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Gayan Potter is a voice artist, actress, mum of twins, an all-round good egg, Every night, her voice announces the news on the television, and no matter what's been happening in the world, tragedy, political unrest, mass genocide, it's her job to sound neutral, unbiased, collected, and in control. But the reality is that a few years ago, Gayan, you felt anything but. No, I certainly didn't feel any of those things, far from it. Um, in 2016, I had a breakdown, and it lasted a full year. Wow. And so <laughs> while the world was in its own chaos and I was having to announce to the country what was about to, you know, be talked about and sound cool, calm and collected, mm. I was indeed, I was just anything but I was I was um, having to wipe away the tears and the panic attacks and uh, crawl into the voice booth, usually in my pyjamas. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and announce the, the news bulletins throughout the day, which was just the most bizarre experience to get your head around um, especially when you're announcing something that's you know if you, because if a news anchor uh, has to go somewhere specific like you know say the Boston bombing for example rather than it just coming from the studio they will send one of their news anchors there so I then have to re-announce again that you know so in my head I'm looking at these horrific things happening in the world and thinking oh my lord you know that's but but my own snow globe was just as explosive, um, wow. yeah. So it was a it would it was a really strange, strange time to do the job that that I do. So we'll go back in a little while to how it felt to be announcing the news at that time in your life. Um, but let's go back to I suppose let's go back to the very beginning. Um, there's all sorts of things that could lead to a breakdown. Um, but let's start. Right in the early days, um, what kind of a childhood did you have? Because I know that there were, there were some fairly major ups and downs back then as well. You were very shy, weren't you? Oh, I was really shy, which, you know, people that know me now kind of do a, huh? Like a, what? But yeah, I was an incredibly shy child. Um, and my mum wasn't a stage mum by any stretch of the imagination, but I always had shown that I wanted to act. I'd always had that kind of... Um, Oh, I'd love to do that, but yet uh, no confidence whatsoever. Is that because you wanted to be on the stage and be noticed or because you just had a particular talent for, you know, accents or... Do you know, I think it was possibly both. Right. I, um, I have a, a half-brother and sister, but they're older than me, so I effectively grew up as an only child. And I grew up in a really small village, so, you know, you made a lot of your own entertainment. So I think I spent a lot of time in my bedroom you know, shutting the curtains, putting on my record player yep. with Kelly Marie in the background and, you know, and, and dancing like I was a superstar, as <laughs> a lot of little girls and boys do. Um, but in front of people, I wasn't like that. I, I, yet, I have this memory of going on, um, we used to go to this, it wasn't, um, we couldn't afford butlins, you know, it, mm. was, it was kind of the cheap version. And um, we would go to these places and invariably, as they had in the in the early 80s, talent competitions for the kids. And, you know, and we would go into the room and there'd be all these kids standing with their lipstick on and their smiley faces because you had to audition. Yeah. And my mum would be at the back kind of going, go on, 
go on, go on, Gian. You can. I'm like, no, no, mm. no. And she said, go, go on. Because she knew I wanted to. And then I'd get to the front of the queue and I'd be like, I'm still here in B flat, you know. <laughs> And, and pull out this, you know, sort of this persona from somewhere, you know, and you could you could feel my mum thinking, see, I knew, I knew that, wow. you know, and I once won a disco dancing competition, right? Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, wearing, I need to see these moves. Oh, it was amazing. Well, you know, what was <laughs> particularly special about it was not only was the purple lycra matching from what every woman wants, um, shop uh, but I had a broken arm in a oh, wow. plaster cast <laughs> yeah. did it just spin round it just by spun round I just did a lot of like almost like I don't know kind of like nudging movements with the one arm <laughs> but it must have been spectacularly impressive the rest of my being <laughs> I won us this holiday uh, to go back really? yeah to go back and stay oh, in a caravan for two weeks um, <laughs> oh god was that the second prize that was it yeah it was like and the first prize that you think oh my god um, yeah, and then I would sort of recoil into being this quiet, shy person as soon as, you know, the spotlight wasn't on. Primary school for me was, I hated it. Oh, really? I absolutely hated it. I was I was smart. Mm. I found it really stressful. Um, it was a tiny little country school. There was only 30 pupils in the whole school. Oh, wow. And I've got these memories of my mum pushing me in the door and the headmistress pulling me in the door oh. because I just didn't want to go. And at the time, you know, it's at that point it was like late 70s. Nobody really said, hmm, perhaps there's something going on with that child. Um, it was a case of, you know, get in the school and, and, and do your job. But I now realise looking back that I was suffering anxiety. Yeah. And I didn't have a name in those days though, did it? No, it didn't have a name. You were just being difficult, mm. um, you know. And um, because of what's gone on for me through my life, I now can see the pattern started when I was very, very young with, the, you know, the adrenaline and not knowing why I felt this anxiety, but I just did and not feeling safe, mm. really. Because I know that your your parents ran the village shop, so presumably they they were very busy morning, noon and night. It must have been, was it open for a long time? Yeah. It was it was a classic, you know, opened at sort of five in the morning and it shut at seven o'clock wow. at night and they took an hour for the lunch. But because it was a village shop, to be fair, people would knock on the door and say, oh, you know, I'm passing. Is there any chance I could? And also we lived above and behind it. So the, the house was very public. The living room was also full of cupboards which belonged to the shop store. There was pre-mobile phones, clearly pre-computers. Mm. We, you know, we'd one house phone and it rang all day because it was a shop. Yeah. And my parents were... They were busy, but also what was rumbling underneath all of that was my father was an alcoholic. Right. And obviously as a very young child, I, I didn't know this. I didn't, a lot of it I think was hidden from me. And also you wouldn't have known any different because it's your own normal, isn't it? It's, it's Exactly. It's, it's your normal. And he, I mean, he bought the shop. Uh, pissed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he I think came, you'd have to be sometimes to want to run a village shop. Yeah, he came home one day and and apparently said to my mother, "I've bought a shop." <laughs> She's like, "Sorry, what?" <laughs> I mean, there were moments of of ridiculous hilarity with my dad. Mm. At times, I remember him using me like as a shield in a hotel. He was hungry in the middle of the night, he got the munchies, so he took me down with him into the kitchen and we broke in and stole <laughs> a chicken carcass out the fridge. <laughs> I mean, in the pitch black in this massive kitchen. But then there were moments, the roller coaster was horrendous and there were utterly horrific times. Yeah. But knowing what we know now, my dad was suffering PTSD. Right. He served some time in Iraq when he was on his national service and they were taken prisoner of war. So you can understand, obviously. And he was also in the fire service after that. And that was, you know, pre-fancy breathing apparatus days. So the village wasn't very big. It was that unspoken, but everybody probably had an idea. Yeah. But my my dad, he was not a pub drinker. He was not a falling about um, oh, look at the state of that drinker. He was a high-functioning alcoholic. Yeah. But consequently, my home life was chaotic because my mum was dealing with my dad mm. um, 
And also in those days, the village shop was the hub of the community. Of That's where people went, you know. Mm-hmm. My mother, she was this amazing, she was like a walking computer. People would walk in and she'd say, you need eggs and you've not <laughs> bought milk for three days and you need to pay your papers. And she was this incredible, almost like a pack horse of information yeah. as well as dealing with things. But I witnessed my mum in the evenings when the shop was closed this demeanour of quite forceful and in control women changed and she became like a mouse because obviously she knew what was what was going to happen. And as a child, that's got to rub off on you. Yeah. And the feeling of the lack of control in your family environment clearly must have rubbed off on me. And I felt I had no control and I felt I had no safe place. Mm. My dad was like a Jekyll and Hyde with alcohol. And I can openly talk about it with his blessing because he's been sober for over 30 years now and is an amazing man and uh, has helped hundreds of people um, recover from um, addiction of, of alcohol. You know, he still goes to AA meetings. He's, he still says, you know, this is that really he should have been dead and that, mm. you know, he feels grateful to be here. So talking about it is kind of, it's OK within our, within our family. Yeah. And we've also agreed it's made us who... It's moulded parts of who we are oh, today, course. even yeah. though we would probably change things. But but you can choose um, to be shaped by your experiences or to be angry about them, can't you? And I think that... Yeah. And I've done both. We've had this conversation before. Mm. I, I have definitely done both. I've been raging, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and raged at therapists about the consequences of these things. And then I've done, I've done the forgiveness route and then I've done the, oh my goodness, you know, it could be, could be anybody. I mean... I don't believe you choose to become an addict. Mm. I believe there's a reason why you take that slippery slope and then for whatever reason you, you know, you you carry on using whatever your substance is. Yeah. You know, my home life was there was no safety. I didn't feel it was like living waiting for a, a, an earthquake or a volcano that you knew was coming every day, but you didn't know when and you didn't know how bad it was going to be. So for me, my adrenal system learned to live in a fight or flight state. Right. And that is key to how my um, mental health and my physical health kind of became the status quo, really. But I just thought it was normal because nobody talked about mm. mental ill health in children or anxiety. Or well, it, they didn't. No, it was just, you know. It wasn't discussed, was it? Exa- no, exactly. It was different times. It was not discussed. And you look back now and I, I suppose you think, God, you know, why did we not see that? And you, you and I have got teenagers who are roughly the same sort of age, twin boys, yeah. both of us. And, um, you know, we, we've discussed before how, how, how much better it is in some ways that young people are talking about their mental health. Um, but it, we, there's still so far to go. Hugely far and to go. if you think about how it is now compared to how it was 30 years ago, we, we've come on leaps and bounds, but we've still got a long way. We've still got a massive long way. But I, I do think, I, I mean, I'm very, very open with my twin mm. boys about my struggles. Well, they've witnessed, they witnessed obviously a year of, of it. But, um, you know, they know about my childhood mm. because I want them to be able to feel that they can if something's worrying them or, 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 you know, if they're starting to, to struggle a bit, that they can they can talk about it yeah. without the stigma. I didn't talk about it because I, not because I didn't want to talk about it, but I didn't know it was abnormal to feel that way. I think that's the point, isn't it? I think we spend so much yeah. time thinking that everything that we experience as children is normal because it is to us. Yeah, I just thought, I thought, you know, homes, shit school shit yeah. but that's just how everybody feels surely mm-hmm. early life had been really tough really tough but I think there was always like an underlying anxiety in everything that I did mm-hmm. um, I found drama school really stressful touring theatre touring adrenaline was always really bad yeah I remember doing the first national tour of train spotting and uh, well I was in theatres that were Getting standing ovations and this phenomenon was on stage and I was just an absolute wreck of full of adrenaline. Um, and then a disastrous first marriage when I was 23 mm-hmm. and he was only 21 and we should never have got married. We were just kids. We'd only known each other six months and um, when I was in Panto, he ghosted me after about a year of marriage. Um, literally disappeared. Wow. 
Um, I mean, I did get the it's not you, it's me chat, yep. you know, a few days before, but, but he just disappeared. And um, he was always someone that was looking for the next challenge and the next adventure in life. So I can understand now why he did what he did yep. 20 odd years down the line. And we remained friends, actually, once it all kind of settled. Mm-hmm. And he went on to spend his life full of adventure and trying new things, new experiences. He was always helping people. Right. But he sadly passed away last year from cancer. While we we were friends in our later life, we did used to laugh about if he was going to pick a time to leave. Panto, really? (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, kids are screaming, he's behind you. And I'm thinking, no, he fucking isn't. And I don't know where he is. And I might just say my lines or I might just cry and tell you to all fuck off because my husband's disappeared and my life's falling apart. But I would have got sacked, so that wasn't an option. Yeah. And I returned home and I felt so alone and I felt so frightened and I just was desperate to, just to feel, not like I was living on this emotional edge of potential terror all the time. Okay. And not having any idea that that wasn't a natural state of of being. And what I ended up doing was I actually ended up going to live with my childhood best friend Mm. and her husband, who was the minister of the church uh, in the sort of nearby village, Uh who was a a bit more kind of happy clappy. But I ended up going to live with them. They said, look, come and live with us. Yeah. Um, They had a few children, so it was an extra pair of hands around the house. Because always do, don't they? Oh, I think think we're... Nine now, eight. They're amazing. They're amazing people. <laughs> they, get a telly, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they, no, they're amazing people, and they they took me in and uh, and I lived there. So it was a, Aww. it was bittersweet though because I felt safe, although I still was struggling. But I I I you know I felt safe. But at the same time, I was witnessing everything that I wanted, which was yes. normality and mm. children and marriage and safety, security. Yeah. Well, one day the doorbell rang. Right. And this man was standing at the door and I I looked at him and I thought, I think I know your face. Mm. And he just stared at me and went bright red. And he said, Gayan, it's, it's me, it's Alan. I said, Alan? He said, Alan Galbraith? I was like, what? Oh my goodness, my first ever boyfriend, ever, wow. ever, from when I was 15. And effectively, in a nutshell, he had come looking for me. Oh. Specifically. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Because he I always... cause it, cause he's nothing to do with acting, is he? A, nothing is... at all. Nope. He's a spark. Right. He's an electrician. I was going to say, so I thought he'd maybe come yeah. to, uh, nope, to fix nothing your... nothing at all. He... <laughs> Could you come and wire this for me? Um... <laughs> Worst porno ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he's nothing to do with that at all, okay. thank the Lord. But he, he and I dated when I was 15, he was 17. Oh. And then I was too young to get into pubs, obviously. So I got dumped. Yeah, of course. And then we didn't see each other for 16 years. We had nothing to do with each other at all. Okay. But, but the minister and Alan were best friends as children. Right. Right. So there was an affinity there, but then uh, the minister found God and Alan found beer, right? So, yep. you know, the teenagers, they <laughs> went their separate ways. Well, you know, <laughs> so, so there was an understanding of it wasn't ridiculous for him to turn up at this door, but, mm. he, you know, but he came with the preface of, uh, handing in some old CDs that he thought uh, he thought Mark might like to listen right. to. And of course he rang the bell and I opened it. So for both of us, it was a kind of Scooby-Doo moment. Yeah. You know, I had a boyfriend at the time. I had got in tow with this, this guy who was the complete opposite of my first husband in every way. Right. He was mm, nice, but a bit of a Mr Bean character. Uh-huh. Not very emotionally available. Probably everything I didn't need at that point in my life. Well, I think um, sometimes you end up with somebody that Somebody like that is exactly what you need. Yeah. Because you've maybe had somebody that was one way or the other. Yeah, that's probably about right, actually. I remember, though, I remember him saying to me one day, we went to his best friend's wedding and I had a right hump on because we'd been together a few months, no, 18 months or something by that point. And I was thinking, really? Like, come on. We didn't even live together or anything. And uh, I had a right hump on thinking, when is it my turn? You mm. know? And he said to me, well... I just think that when you meet the right person, it's like a racing car. Yeah. And you're a bit more like a Volvo. (laughs) (laughs) To be 
actually actually said he to actually me. said that to you at a wedding. Yeah, yeah at, at a wedding, right? <laughs> but the saddest thing is I didn't smack him in the face no. and walk off. I just went, oh, because, oh. you know. But um, Alan and I were, uh, he, you know, he pursued me for a while. Good. And um, we texted each other and and then we wow. we got married in uh, 2003 Aww. you know but but I think if we got married when we were young we would we wouldn't still be together I, this, I think that's know. that's often the way I, I've I've always said that about um well you know, about my 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 other half now you know I just think actually if we'd have met 10 years ago when he was lost available and I wasn't available yeah. you know it, it had had yeah. I just don't think that we would have you know no and I think a second marriage often has You've just got more patience, more understanding. You've got more perspective. Hey, wait till you get to the third. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> so, so um, I felt like I had finally, finally found safety and found yeah. peace and found the very thing that made me complete. Yeah, you know. I was deeply in love. I was totally supported. My acting and voicing was, I was getting more and more. I was doing really well. Mm. We bought a house together. Um, we decided to try for a family and uh, fell pregnant immediately. Like a kind of, sorry, uh, <laughs> are you actually I'm sure? i enjoying the, the, yeah, the practicing, uh, yeah, but well, there you are. Yeah, well, he, he was mostly <laughs> upset. He was like, well, that was, you know, I wasn't expecting it to be such a short-lived experience. Um, with twins, wow. as you know. Mm. Um, yeah, twin, twin yeah, boys. Fun. But everybody looking in saw, uh, you know, perfect couple family. in love. Yeah. yeah, perfect family. You know, gosh, she's only had to have one pregnancy. Mm. You're like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, and, and my business was, was building. I had, when the boys came along, I decided to build my own studio mm -hmm. to voice from because voice work was becoming more and more. And obviously I couldn't just nip off the studio here, there and everywhere. No. Put in my own studio and and work from home. And as you well know, being a, a, a wife, mm -hmm. a mom, a full-time, uh, whatever you do as a job, yes. it's, it's a lot. It is. It's yeah. a lot. And you but, never quite switch off either because you're, no. you're, you're at home. And it's brilliant to work from home in many everything. ways, but it also means that you're never quite off duty. Yes, exactly. Mm. You never get that breast bite. Um, so I, I, you know, I ploughed in and I carried on and I was feeling um, everything was, was, I suppose, from the outside looking and was going swimmingly, yeah. really. And then 2016 happened. Mm. And I think 2016 was a spectacularly shit year. It really was. In the universe. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, I remember seeing something on Facebook. I think it was Facebook. Just one of these memes. Um, and mm -hmm. it said something like, well, I'm not saying that David Bowie was holding the whole fabric of the universe together or anything, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> Look at this mess. <laughs> what a shit show. I mean, it really was. It was kind of a place your bets, who's dying today. It was extraordinary mm. um, amongst, obviously, political madness. Well, that was the thing, wasn't it? You know, not, yeah. not only did... Um, well, we, we lost. I mean, I, I know very well, obviously, because my husband died that year. Um, yep. and, and, and actually, I was quite... Um, surprised and, and proud that he'd made it onto the this list of pe important people who died that year because there were just so many there was there was prince there was victoria wood who died in the same week as phil there was alan rickman there was david bowie there was everybody literally every george and, michael. Right, and rightly so yeah yeah, yeah. george michael rightly so that phil was on there he, well, he you know yeah but but, but, it, but even so there but, were just I mean, what, so many people you're gonna people. keep company well, yeah. you're gonna keep company <laughs> you're gonna have a party well, somewhere it. it's a cracking guest list <laughs> no, let's be fair <laughs> <laughs> saying at his, at his funeral, you know, that I'm, I'm hoping right now he's dancing in purple rain with Prince and having Victoria Aww. beat him on the bottom with a woman's weekly. It's weekly. <laughs> <laughs> love that. I love that. It was, it was, you know, if you believe in uh, something other or, um, you know, the yep. universe having forces or whatever, it's, something was going something on. Was I don't know. Weird was going, yeah, because then we had it Brexit was and then bizarre. we had Trump and, yep. yeah. It was just but it was just, can we start again? Can we have a do-over, mm. as they say? And I don't remember the majority of that year. Wow. Because 
I realized quite quickly that I was going into a place, a dark, dark place, mm. with very little warning. Obviously, my husband was able to say, do you know what? You weren't great for a while. You mm. seemed really short-tempered. You seemed really sad all the time. You were you were worried. I, wor- I was worrying. I was ruminating yeah. about lots and lots of things. And yes, there was some stuff going on for us with extended family and mm. my children's school. Yeah. We were having to move life, them and things. Life but was happening. Life, yeah. life was happening. And we'd moved into a new house and the builders were being were making spectacular errors left, right and mm. centre. And um, the day I finally, um, I think, realised that I was not coping was I <laughs> walked from my house across the building site mm. into the office of the groundsman and who was sat there in his hard hat eating a packet of what's it mm. and I shouted you're all a bunch of <laughs> at the top of my voice wow. I did I did and that's not like you it's not like me at all. You know, um, we all like to swear he, sometimes, but yeah. you know, you're just yeah. warm and friendly and forgiving well, of people, but forgiving, not today. Yeah, but no, I, not today. No. This was not the day. And I, I turned round. He just sat there with like kind of what's it half in and half out his mouth. And behind him, behind the door, were all the workers that just left my house, sitting on a bench, having their uh, their picnics, mm. right? Just looking at me like mad woman from number 14 wow. <laughs> and then I left and went oh I hate the world and cried all the way back into the house mm. put my pyjamas on and and got into my bed wow. and I think I cried myself to sleep On a typical day how would you feel how would it go how did you manage to get up and work on days that you just didn't feel like getting up That's a really good question um, To be honest I didn't feel like getting up Ever, <laughs> ever, um, because w- what happens is you, your body works on this 24 hour clock and it kind of doesn't matter whether you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night or three in the morning, your body clock remains pretty much the same. So for me, what happened was around about three o'clock in the morning, I would wake up involuntarily and it would literally be a, <gasps> with, with a, like you'd had a nightmare, I'd wake up dripping mm. in sweat. My heart was racing, my stomach was in knots. I mean, it was just filled with butterflies. I was full of adrenaline. Um, Terror, actually. It's like real blown terror. Uh, But no logical reason for that whatsoever. And you you just think, no, 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 not again, not again. So you, but you're exhausted. It's like you've climbed a mountain. You're so tired because when you've got depression and anxiety your body never goes into the deep REM sleep it just it can't physically do it when which is when you heal your cells all heal so when you're mentally unwell you literally are running on an empty tank rather than okay the logical mind says I'm full of adrenaline I need to get up I need to move I need to get this out my system because it's effectively rushing around my bloodstream I need to you know get rid of it you just curl up into this fetal position and sort of roll around and sweat and fidget and cry and watch the clock just going so slowly until the world gets light and everyone else gets about their day. Mm. And then usually what would happen for me is this tsunami of grief would come over me, like a crying to the bottom of the well of yourself, really is a best way to describe it you're crying you can't help it for a start and then you're you're crying for your own frustration that you're still in this pit so you're dealing with almost like extreme grief at one side and then high high end terror at the other it's it's a molotov cocktail for your body you're trying Mm. to do two things at once and you know when you've been in your car and somebody nearly hits you or you nearly hit somebody and you get that (gasps) you know and your stomach goes well it's Mm -hmm. like that for hours Hours and hours wow. and hours. That that emotion, it just doesn't settle. And so your brain is trying to settle it and saying, what's the matter with you? There's nothing wrong. There's, nobody's got a gun to your head. Behave yourself. What's the matter? Mm. And the more you tell yourself that, the worse it gets because then you think, I'm losing my mind, like I must be mental, mm. which you then ruminate, you overthink everything. You become more and more exhausted. Then the guilt hits you because you're useless, because you can't get up and function in the normal day like everyone else. But in your mind, the entire whole world is functioning perfectly well. You're the only one who's not. So you must feel very alone. 
you're so, oh, so alone. It. And I would spend the whole time saying to my kids and saying to my husband, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And they would say, it's not your fault, it's not your fault, you're not well. But it, it kind of doesn't sink in because, well, depression and anxiety are very, very loud monsters and they mm. scream incredibly loudly. And you have nothing to hang your hat on. You, well, for me anyway, I couldn't say, well, you know what, Tuesday was all right. Today's mm. a bit rubbish, but yeah, because it had just been rubbish for a long time. And then my phone would start to go, the emails would ping in. I I would try and ignore it for as long as I thought I could get away with it. And then I would avoid speaking to people on the phone, but I would reply via email, which gave me less, it made me have to lie less, if you like. And I would make, you know, session times and then I would just come into the booth. To this day, I have no idea how I did it, but I'm really proud of myself because I would sit in sessions willing all these feelings to just settle for a second while I pretended to somebody that I was absolutely fine when they were talking about the nonsense they'd done at the weekend or the weather or whatever. And I'm trying to join in, but in the meantime, I don't really care and I'm not really listening. So I've in between sessions, sometimes I would be in here for hours and I wouldn't eat because I didn't eat when I was really low. I, I'm not a comfort eater. I'm one of these, I feel anxious, don't feed me. So obviously mm. my blood sugar is all over the place. And then you feel so you're physically exhausted. Your head hurts all the time. Matt Haig talks about it in his book he he says it's like you're walking around with your head on fire but nobody can see it and that is bang on how it feels then as the day goes on because obviously you've been up and you've been moving the adrenaline starts to dissipate the cortisol starts to dissipate and naturally as human beings we start to produce melatonin in the afternoon which is the sleepy hormone so you start to settle and often by five six seven o'clock at night I felt completely normal. Right. Not, you know, singing, dancing, but no adrenaline. I felt actually, mm. oh, this is okay. Yeah, at peace. Th- this is okay. I mean, physically exhausted, like I'd gone 10 rounds, you know, mm. but oh, thank God. And then, so I'd want to stay up because I didn't want to go to bed when I felt remotely normal. And I'd stay up till maybe 10, 11 at night, catch up with my husband and, and go to my bed. And then four hours later, bang, mm. three in the morning. <gasps> Adrenaline with no rhyme or reason. And that was that was my a year of my life was like that. It's an illness just like any other horrific physical illness, but nobody can see it. They just say things to you like, Oh, you've lost weight, or Oh, you look a bit tired, you're a bit run down, you need a holiday, you know, whereas actually your insides are just melting. That's why I think talking about symptoms of mental health, <clears throat> symptoms of anxiety are more than just, oh, she's highly strung. You know, the words we used to use, she's highly mm. strung, she's easily upset. You you can't help it. And that's the, the problem. We put so much pressure on ourselves to be well in the yeah. head. And yeah. there, there's absolutely yeah. no reason why we should be well in any part of our body, particularly. No, um, no you know, we, we do drive ourselves, ourselves to a certain extent, but, you know. We do, we do. Sometimes. And I think the guilt of being ill almost made me iller because... You're yeah. then so, so apologetic. And well, if anybody's... Look, I did that when I had cancer, you know, for the same reason. <laughs> really? You know, did just, you? I'm, really? Yeah, I'm just so sorry to my kids. You know, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. I'm so, And you would have been exactly the same. Yeah. And I know that yeah. I would have been the same no matter what had been wrong with me, you know, yeah. it, uh, because you just feel so sorry for the fact yeah. that you're supposed to be the mum <laughs> that can do everything. <laughs> and yeah, we the put so much mom. pressure on yeah. ourselves as mums. It doesn't yeah. matter what, and, what and, could be, you know, you could literally be, be lying there with, with no limbs whatsoever. And, yeah, I'm so know, sorry they all fell off. Yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm still going to try and run a marathon. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, you just mentioned the kids there. One of the mm. things that, that I don't regret about this is it has given my boys a very grounded understanding of mental health and it's okay to say I'm not okay and you know they're young teenagers and the world is difficult there isn't that stigma in their society now I've noticed it they'll talk about it and it's talked about in their school which is brilliant you know it it, is um, and they're very open and if more people talk yeah 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 it's not that kind of what yeah, and I think that you, you've got to try and find a positive um, slant on anything that you've been through. Um, mm. in the, I mean, I've, I've done the same with my boys when, I mean, not so much now because they're 14, but when when I first had my mastectomy, they were maybe 
11, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And I made it happen that they saw me without any clothes on um, because I thought Mm -hmm. they need to see this. They need to see what a real woman looks like. And one day they might be married to a woman that is going through the same thing. And I don't want Mm -hmm. them to have this kind of... Because they've got so many... And this is the same with mental health, physical health. They're thrown all these images of the perfect life, whether it's perfect bodies or perfect lifestyle or whatever, and whether it affects your mental health or your physical health. It's all really affecting to our teenagers and I think it's really important that we show our kids actually this is what a real person looks like you love somebody that looks like this and look I'm still I'm still mum Um, yeah 100% I I mean they never really said anything I think they were just like mum (laughs) yeah can we get past the choice mum yeah (laughs) is the Simpsons on yeah I know (laughs) we make this huge deal about it and they go and yeah and Anything Lost else? I know. It's been done already. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah it's, I, I mean, I guess, and as 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 mums, if we can equip them with that emotional mm. understanding, that's that's another job ticked off the never-ending list. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd love to know when the yeah. uh, when the list finishes. Because I remember talking to you at, at that same sort of time, and and I'd been diagnosed with cancer, and you you were having this breakdown, and we, you know, we, we, it was a great fun conversation. <laughs> yeah, I tell yeah. you, <laughs> <laughs> misery loves company. I know. <laughs> but I remember uh, through that conversation, just thinking, hang on a minute, I'm really lucky because although we didn't know at that point was my cancer curable, but we knew that. We could give it a shot. And these are the drugs that we would need to use in order. Yeah. yeah. We would need to use those drugs. And if those drugs work and that bit of surgery, then I'll be okay. Yeah. Whereas with you, it was total trial and error. Totally. And, it was and just you feel like a lab rat. That yeah. In the, yeah. And in the middle of it all, as long as, it, you know, just hoping against hope that it wouldn't just get too much for you in the meantime. Um, and I think that sometimes we forget that physical illnesses are horrible, but they're either curable or they're not yeah you know whereas with mental illness it's just so hard one day I was starting to feel a little bit better but still the anxiety was bad and a producer that I work with quite a lot Mm -hmm. dialed in for a session and he said to me at the end of the session can I ask you something are you okay you just don't quite sound like yourself today and I broke down because Mm. the permission was given to me. And I broke down and I told him where I was. And he said to me, oh, my wife has that. My wife struggles and I've struggled. I've been there. I get it. I understand. It's, you know, and we had this affinity of, do you feel like this? And have you tried this? Where are you in your journey? Mm. And it made me feel validated that it was okay. Because if I'd had something else, I would have been able to say, oh, I, I, I've got this, but I'm doing this about it. And and I still kept it close to my chest Yeah. while I was recovering. It was important for me to do that until, well, I got well, I remember it distinctly, the 13th of January, 2017. Oh, right. Is a date I hold dear mm-hmm. because I was I was given a medication to switch off my adrenal gland to just for a month to just basically it was like you know taking the accelerator off the car yeah and uh, it's an incredible medication that has so many different ways of working depending on what you take Mm -hmm. and and I was told to take it at night and I woke up in the morning and I came downstairs and my husband said to me well and I remember standing there and kind of looking around the kitchen wide-eyed searching for this is it there is the monster there? And I said, no, he's not there. Wow. And I smiled and I laughed for the first time in I don't know how long because I, this horrendous pain and um, monkey on your back really was was not there. They'd got off. Wow. And that was from a drug? Literally from a drug. Yeah, it was from a drug. And I went out that night. My closest friends knew, obviously, Mm. what I'd been through. And it was one of my closest friends' son's 21st Mm -hmm. in town. And, of course, we'd said, listen, thanks thanks for the invite, blah. Mm. And I walked in to that nightclub, dressed up, (laughs) makeup on, and they kind of went, what? And I said, 
don't ask, don't ask the questions, but I'm here. Wow. And I feel different. And over the course of the next month, um, it, it didn't come back. It didn't come back. We'd reset the engine. And the therapist said to me, I think that you've had a misfiring adrenal gland ever since you were a tiny wow. girl. You've had low running serotonin because you've been living in a fight or flight situation ever since you were a little girl because of your home circumstances and possibly genetically predisposed. But your body, when it was doing all its growing, was living in a, effectively like a war zone. Wow. So you've learned that just to be ready, just to be ready. And I, I actually hugged him. <laughs> <laughs> I put my arms around this oh. man because he was giving me permission to look back at all these years and say, it wasn't meant to be no. like that. That's not, you know, and he was saying to me, that's incredible that you've got to now to finally, you've managed to carry this all your life and and mm. still be here and still have coped and still have raised yeah. children and have built a business from the ground up and fallen in love and coped with divorce and coped mm. with life, just coped with what we what we all go through. He said to me, you know, it's going to take about a year for you to get your resilience to, to where it could be and should be. Mm. So just be gentle with yourself these next few months. Don't be disappointed if you feel a bit rubbish or you don't cope with something particularly well one yeah. day or maybe your stress, you know, your stress reactions may be a bit over or whatever. And that's where I've been since then. Mm. Um, I can honestly say that I'm not stupid enough to say never say never. No. But you can't ever say never. But I would certainly look at it with a very different set of eyes mm -hmm. because I have seen the light at the end of the tunnel. I have seen recovery happen. I do know what my triggers are now. Mm. And, and I'm stronger. And I don't even know if I would change it. No. To be honest, the length of it, yes, yes. Mm. A whole year away from your family emotionally is horrible. And to watch my children watch me go through that is distressing. Mm. But it's made me who I am right now, here, today. And it's it's allowed me to talk to other people and give other people the permission to say they're not okay. Mm. And then I can say, do you know what? I've not been okay. And because people know me as being humorous and, uh, you know, mm. a bit, bit loudmouthed and a bit <laughs> kind of a spades a spade type of yeah. person, sometimes it's surprising for them when they then discover there's this whole other side to yeah. Gayanne that they had no idea was there. Mm. It makes you human uh, because vulnerability makes you human, I think. Absolutely. There's a book that I only read recently, and perhaps if I'd read it while I was unwell, by Matt Haig, Reasons to Stay Alive. Yeah. The most incredible piece of writing. Everybody should read it, whether you've had illness mm. or know somebody or, or just haven't. I follow him on Twitter. He's doing great stuff every day to just be really open about talking about mental ill health. Yeah. He's brilliant. And when I read his book, so much of what he wrote down, I thought, oh, Yes, that's me. Mm. Well, I thought that. That's me. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. When you find, rec you know, familiarity in something, it's a comfort. Mm. So for me now, I'm not ashamed of it. Mm. I couldn't help it. No. It's not my fault. And I'm actually really pretty damn proud of myself that I managed to keep a job going, keep a business, you know, growing mm. through all of that. I think I'm stronger now than I've ever been because I can see what is possible even when you're massively, massively struggling. And you have shown that it is possible <laughs> even in your pyjamas, in your darkest times. To, <laughs> even in your pyjamas. To sound <laughs> as calm and assured and so perfectly together. People, of course, will well, because I don't sound like this when I'm working, I, you know, mm. many people won't know that I'm and naturally Scottish. But yes, maybe now anybody listening to this will be picturing a, a wee Jimmy Cranky in her <laughs> purple lycra with a broken arm. <laughs> I think it'll make the news far more interesting. <laughs> Listen, I think we should petition for that. 
You've been listening to Tales from the Tannoy with Eleanor Hamilton and Gayam Potter and with music from Beats Bakery. This podcast was produced by Carl Svensson at Tadar Media.